Cool, I'm Alex Fafega and today's talk is Artificial Creativity. Um, so I'm a creative technologist and an interaction designer. Um, I'm co-founder at a design studio called Kamuzi. Um, a lot of our work is really interesting. Um, I'm a social lecturer at the University of Arts in London Creative Computing Institute. I kind of teach on machine learning and creativity. And I'm a 2019 to 2020 Google artist and machine intelligence um, grant recipient, which I'm going to touch on um, a little further um, in the screen. So AI is a part of our everyday life. You know, um, it, it exists in everything we use, it exists in everything we essentially kind of, kind of do, you know, from Gmail, from Spotify, from Netflix, a lot of the things that we've probably been using at home over this period of lockdown tends to be powered by some form of artificial intelligence. And I always love to bring this slide up when I talk because of, um, I hope we have a better understanding right now about you know, artificial intelligence in general. But when I first came across the space and I was really interested, a lot of the narratives that was always framed was about machine, it was always about these metallic machines who hate humans and who essentially are gonna destroy us all. And the more I got into it, I realized that artificial intelligence really is just like mass formulas, statistics, anal um, analyzing data to be able to get a result. And I, I, always have, I have this image here, for example, of this cat where we see this cat. However, this is what the computer sees. The computer sees that in numbers and the computer is always trying to somehow make some form of classification or some form of prediction. So as you see it over here, um, if I get the pointer out, where you've got this image classification, and it's still at this point where it still thinks 82% of this is a cat, 15% of it could be a dog, 2% of it could be a hat, and 1% of it could be a mug. I wonder how many of us have got cop mugs at home. And, but if I go into this introduction, you know, the computer scientist has been inspired by the human brain for a very long time. And through that, they were able to develop neural networks, quite similar to how the brain functions, because we do have neural networks as well in our, in our, you know, and through these neural networks, what essentially happens is they read inputs. So for example, which I have here, where you've got a cat, you've got a dog image, and it goes through a multitude of layers. And as you can see in this illustration, and then the computer is able to generate an output. So that's how the sort of initial essence of a neural network works. And so I always describe artificial intelligence as this, the art of how to make computers do things at which humans are currently better at, and the process of machines learning to think like humans. That is the whole sort of theme behind this concept of um, artificial intelligence. And this is a really good project you might want to check out. I worked on it in 2018 with uh, my team at Kimizi and it's called AI Cheat Sheet. And we've just kind of put like a bunch of words associated with the term artificial intelligence. And we tried to make it simple for everybody to essentially understand. We never updated it after then, but I think it's still a very good website to try out. So let's talk about machine learning real quick. Cause this, you know, and one of the key things I kind of might be using throughout the rest of this, um, talk is more the term machine learning rather than artificial intelligence. I think artificial intelligence is more the common term, but machine learning is kind of really what is happening when we talk about artificial intelligence. So machines or computers or, you know, kind of learn in three ways and it's supervised learning and supervised learning and reinforcement learning. And so supervised learning in this case is that you label the data that you train the machine with. And so in this case here, in this image that we have, where we've got, you know, the hashtags, you use a created hashtag, and you're posting a picture on Instagram, or, you know, in that case, and we're using hashtags, essentially what we're kind of doing is labeling this image to be associated with some form of, you know, this is a burger, fries, food, happy. And so essentially the algorithms in Instagram, for example, are able to understand what's being labeled there. And then over time, when you see things pop up in your feed, when you see things kind of essentially exist in your discovery feed, this is kind of what we are contributing and the algorithms, when we bring the algorithms, this is essentially what they're doing. 
We have unsupervised learning, where the machine aims to learn from data that's not labeled. And so a perfect example from this is if you're shopping on an e-commerce website and you had purchased an item number one. Um, in this case, I ordered soy sauce from Amazon and, um, and it might suggest to me something else to go with my soy sauce. So that's kind of unsupervised learning where the machine is beginning to understand my patterns and is trying to suggest me something else. And then there's reinforcement learning, which is really interesting. Um, and the machine learns by trial and error through reward or punishment. So that is the aspect of reinforcement. So you can kind of see it here on the screen that most of it is kind of related to games. And some examples of what machines can do right now is stuff like objects, um, object recognition, speech and sound detection, prediction, natural language processing, and translation. So these are like some of the current examples that machines can do. And what I'm gonna do is take us through some projects, take us some tools that kind of show how all of these things essentially come to life. So this is a really good book, which I would advise, you know, people are interested in this space, I would advise you to read. I think it only came out last year actually, but it's The Artist in the Machine, The World of AI Powered Creativity, by Arthur I. Miller. So I'm definitely gonna, it's not an example of a project, but I thought it was a really good book to start up with. Um, I think reading is important as well. So I just wanna suggest this to everyone. So as you can see, hopefully everybody can see it in my GIF and I hope it's quite clear, but this is a project called Scribbling Speech. And the whole purpose of this project was you are able to speak into, you're able to tell a story using your, with your voice and then it will, turn into an animated drawing. So in this case, if you see on the GIF, it's like there's a bird flying, I think it's to the sea. And what happens is that the machine learning model behind it has understood that phrase, and now it's trying to reconstruct that visually. So that's what kind of this project is all about. There's this project of mine, which I really, really love. And um, I, you know, I get my students who, you know, I teach at University of Arts London, who some of them were very much from a dance movement background um, to explore this project. And so this was with BT Jones, a well-known um, um, choreographer who collaborated with Google Creative Lab. And their goal was trying to explore the creative possibilities of pose estimation technology. And so pose estimation technology is um, essentially looks at 18 parts of the human body and it's able to put particular points through dots. That's how it kind of works in its default setting. But in this case here for this particular project, it was using voice and movement. And so in a the case, these dancers were moving and they were speaking and the way they moved, the text would move with them. And that was using machine learning to sort of facilitate that process. Um, a third example I wanna show is called Objectify or Spatial Programming. And this is just a really fun project for anybody there that also likes physical computing um, and comes from that background and is probably here for this talk. But it's just an interesting thing where you're able to train objects in your daily environment to respond to your, your unique behavior. So in the case of this example here, you've kind of got somebody who's, you know, holding a switch to train um, the sort of AI behind the light. And so whenever this individual does movement like this, essentially the light turns up and you know if you have more time you can use that to create a lot of experiences which will be really really um super cool there's also this project i love which is by um alice stewart who's an um, artist but also collaborated with 72 and sunny amsterdam and what alice sort of worked on was basically trained a machine learning model on a bunch of tattoos and then you go to this website, it's called ai.tattoo. You go to this website, it answers you what your tattoo is about, where do you want your tattoo, what particular keywords. And then what happens is that you get this AI generated tattoo idea, which is really weird and really fun. But I think it's a really good exploration of how we can use AI for the creative process. And then we have this project, which I think is just a really fun project. Um, it's called Freddie um, Freddy Meter and it's by, you know, Google Creative Lab, YouTube Music. It's actually just kind of an AI-powered singing challenge that rates how closely your singing matches the voice of Freddie Mercury. 
So it's kind of, you know, karaoke on, on steroids in that case. Um, then we have this project. And if anybody loves fashion, I think you should check it out. It's called One Way Palette. It's by um, a good friend of mine and a good sort of somebody who's guided me on my work, working creativity and machine learning, Cyril and Google Arts and Culture Lab and the business of fashion. And essentially this project really is, is you can upload a photo and the machine learning model will scan the picture in order to determine what particular colors. And then it kind of takes you in this whole essentially experience of, okay, this might be an off-white outfit and it's from 2017. This might be this and it's from this year. And so it kind of looks like everything that's been used in fashion shows over the last I can't remember when, but it's a really extensive database and extensive resource, which could be used for really interesting creative purposes. And then we have this project, which I don't know if how many of you might be familiar with this, but this is the portrait of Elman, the, is it bumbling me? I have no idea, but it's by an artist collective called Obvious. And this is the first artwork that was created using artificial intelligence to be featured in a Chrissy's auction. It was meant to sell for like 10,000, but it actually sold for $432,500. I don't know if, my, if I explained that really well, but it sold for quite a lot of money than it expected to, which kind of in a way sparked up this hype of AI art. So if anybody who's an artist who's really interested in that, you might want to check out the whole world of AI art. Uh, you, know, I'm, you know, I know the art world is kind of slow right now due to what's going on in the world, but I'm guessing there's still a lot of interesting things going on in that space. And so now I just want to go into the tools for create machine learning projects. One of the you know, tools, obviously there's this debate, right? When you're trying to engage with the technology, would I need to learn how to code? Um, and for me, I'm of the bias where I would say, yes, you would love to learn how to code because then you will be able to understand what's going on in the process. However, you don't necessarily have to do that. And I'm going to also show no code tools. Um, most of the examples I showed in this project were mostly using web-based kind of um, interactions, except for maybe the portrait itself, which is using the programming language Python because it's really good for analyzing data, for being able to, you know, and use that for other purposes. But the examples I'm going to show here from a code-based perspective are from using the programming language JavaScript because it's a web-based language, it's a language which, you know, there's loads of information online what people could learn. And so the first one I want to introduce is ml5.js, and that's a JavaScript library for machine learning. And so the whole purpose behind it is to get you to, um, like, simply just create machine learning experiences with just a couple lines of code. And so it's called ml5.js, and if you're really interested, you should check that out. But, and it's kind of built on this is built on tensorflow.js which is um from google and it's a uh, and tensorflow is like a very common machine learning um um library it originally was written in python however if you think of it there for a creative perspective you know if you're a web developer you'd be creating interactive experiences for a while like that whole steep learning curve of having to learn python can like put you off trying to make creative experiences and so Google released this library called tensorflow.js and it tries to sort of essentially allow you to be able to train machine learning models in JavaScript, which I think is really, really cool. Okay, if you don't want to code and you're like, damn, I want to create stuff, but I ain't touching no code, that's perfectly fine. There's Teachable Machine. And Teachable Machine is a really nice uh, project um, by Google Creative Lab. And it's something that I've been working on a lot more. And what you can do around it is you train a computer to recognize your own images, sounds, and poses without coding. So it might have more now, but when I remember using this, I used this a lot to teach my class about how they can train their own machine learning models without writing code. And so if you can see the visual example, what you're seeing is somebody who is, um, she's a really good creative technologist, and by the way, if you don't want to check her out, her name is called Maya Man. And her work is sick. So if you want to check her out using this image, definitely go for it. But what you can see here is, you know, she's uploading a picture from her webcam and training the model. And uh, and it's, you know, it and it, you kind of see some interactions where the model is able to know 
what when it's her and her dog and when it's her by herself. So that type of stuff really works in that case. There's also just um, runway ML, which I kind of call it the Photoshop of machine learning. Um, and it's just really a toolkit that allows creators of all kinds to use artificial intelligence in an intuitive way. So it's, um, you download it on your desktop, you kind of, there's a number of like machine learning models and things that allow you to essentially create a lot of number of experiences. So this GIF here kind of shows you some of the things that are going on in there um, and this particular type of stuff. So I think one way has been really good about trying to reduce that bio barrier of entry because I think that's the challenge, right? Is that barrier of entry, people want to leverage these technologies and do really cool stuff with them, but it's like, how do we make this happen? And so how do we make this stuff? Oops, my, wow. So I'm gonna, cool. I don't know what's happening in my slides, but things are not coming up in my slides. I'm gonna zoom this out because I can't seem to see it. But the machine learning process kind of works essentially in this way. You've kind of got a four step process and the process essentially kind of never stops happening. But what you always need to do in the beginning is you need to collect some form of data. You need, you need a data source. All of those projects had collected some form of data. Then you need to prepare the data. Then you need to train a machine learning model. And then somehow you need to integrate that into a form of a product or a service. So if I go back to my screen, you should be able to just go from here, cool. And so a form of data collection is you may write a particular script to gather data from the internet. So if I wanted to create, I don't know, like a tool, um, a creative tool, which somehow was able to detect every cat in the world from a dog, for example, what I might do is I might write a particular script to download all the cat images that exist from the internet. Um, ten, most of the time, these scripts can be then written in Python uh, because Python is really good for scripting. And then there's like a number of tools which you can use where you can like somehow like source all the, uh, all the information that exists on cats in the image form on the internet and somehow end up in your computer and your fans go off crazy if you have a MacBook and all of those type of stuff. So have the right equipment, so it's really important. The second thing you want to do is because the images have come in different ways, shape and forms, you then need to refine, because essentially it's kind of like raw data. So you then need to refine um, the raw data you've gathered into a suitable format that can be used to train a model. And so what happens at times is um, you, need to, you need to be able to label a lot of the times this picture. Like this is a cat, this is a dog, this is a rabbit, this is a squirrel. And, and so what happens at this situation is people tend to use like a crowd tasking service um, to do this type of stuff, which kind of goes into a lot of the, the ethical implications of working with machine intelligence as well, is that with this type of stuff, when you're preparing the data, people go to platforms like Amazon Turk or other platforms but you have people sitting at home and they're earning like really small amount of money, but they're doing a lot of long hours trying to somehow prepare this data into a really interesting form. And so there's a lot of um, implications as well when you think about training models and, and, and there's a lot of ethical sort of implications, which I didn't touch on in this talk. I've done a lot of talks about that, but I really wanted to focus on just the pure introduction to artificial um, creativity. And so the third step, um, is once you've refined that data, like if you remember that first example I had where with the neural network and I showed that illustration, what then happens then is because the data, you've now refined your data, you've now labeled your data. So what happens is you feed it to the neural network in order to generate an output. And so you're feeding it, you're feeding it loads of cat images. And what happens, you know, it's like over time, the more it sees cats, and is able to see all types of cats, even all different shades, like in terms of light and shades, different things. And over time, it's able to, you, you, you will train the model to understand particular parts, like, okay, because it has ears like this, this most likely would be a cat, but also dogs and cats could have similar ears. So it's like, there's 
a lot of challenges which comes in and you kind of have to you know um go through this particular part and kind of specifically pick points out it doesn't have to be as complicated as this there are a lot of stuff on the internet which are already pre-trained so the, what that means is that they have somebody else has trained it elsewhere and all you have to do is just put it into your work. And so examples like ML5, JS, um, Runway, and Teachable Machine, they kind of solve those problems for you where you don't have to do this process because it can be very complex. It can be a lot of filtering. It can be a lot of coding. It can be a lot of type of stuff. But if you want to control the whole experience, because there's nothing wrong with using a model that's been pre-trained on cat images before, before you've done yours, well, you might want to do yours in a specific way. So you might want to retrain that model. You might want to have more control of the experience. And so th that's something to also bear in mind. And what tends to happen is um, once you train this model and you think it's generating outputs that you're happy with, you normally would embed this into the back end of some, let's say we had to create an interactive website. You embed it into the back end, which is a part of the sees. And then what you try to do is build this really cool front-end experience connecting it all together. And so you have this really interactive experience, some of the examples I showed earlier. And the machine learning model is powering the whole experience, but you essentially don't see the model. It's like you don't see the AI of it itself, but it's kind of existing in the background. That's one of the key things as well, right? You kind of, to create a good creative experience, you kind of want it to exist in the background. You don't want it to be the end and be your, maybe AI tattooed because it's an AI generated thing, but you still kind of want that to be like the presence of this machine type thing to sort of be passive in a way or try to just exist in the background in that form, shape or form. And so I'm going to quickly just show this image, which is just a work in progress of a project I've been working on. Um, it's a collaboration between myself, Google Artists and Machine Intelligence and Google Arts and Culture. And so this project is called Rakim Octavia and I've described it as an interactive web experience that educates an individual through the relationship of black music and technology and Afrofuturism and the storytelling power of rap. And so what I've created is a oracle called Rakim Octavia that studies rap lyrics and then tries to construct new stories about the future based on rap because I've always said that rap is a really good form of storytelling and a lot of black music has been really good about communicating features. And so what for this process, what I've done is I had transcribed lyrics, I had put this and I had used a machine learning model called GP, GPT-2, which is a writing model. So it, it, you feed it text and then it's able to construct new generations of writing. However, it's been trained in a particular way. So it was trained in like English language, like the Queen's English, like 19th century poetry. And what I really wanted to do was to engage with like rap. Like, you know, rap is very complex. It's, you know, people might speak in slang and slang in London is different from how it is in New York. So there's a lot of combination going on uh, together. So this is just a work in progress. And, um, you know, we haven't achieved rhyming yet. Rhyming is still very hard but somehow we're still trying to construct these things together. And I had to, you know, the team I've been working with, we essentially kind of created this whole new machine learning model from scratch because something like this hasn't been done. So we had to train this model from scratch. However, one of my goals is when the project is over and done because we're creating an interactive experience that the machine learning model itself would be access for everybody else so that they could use it to if you want to train it on anything, on Drake, on, I don't know, whoever, Snoop Dogg, you could do it and it would generate content. So as you can see here in the image, it's just screenshots of some of the generations that are going on. Like the Oracle Ricky McTaber forecasts that you'd be lost in the dilemma of my life and death. Rakeem say prepare for struggle. Rakeem say struggle for truth. Search for solutions. Learn about the life and death pages. Look at that powerful words about the future. But that's what I'm currently working on at this period of time, which brings these worlds together. And I've been, you know, and, and I leave here and I think about it. It's like one of the things I'm always trying to figure out with this term of artificial, um, artificial creativity is what is actually creativity? If you were to look at like academic studies or writings or people trying to describe the term creativity, everybody describes it differently. There's no like defined creativity is this, you know, 
And even so, what is creativity? Like, what do we actually deem as creativity? How do we measure creativity of a machine? Because even with these outputs, when we talk about artificial creativity, you know, there's a lot of these debates that machine is going to be more creative than human beings. And, you know, there's a lot of talks about that, which I'm not really a part of that bandwagon. I kind of see machine learning as a tool. And it's a tool that allows me to create new creative experiences that probably could have happened before, but it would have taken me longer. One of the power of machine learn, learning is the ability to analyze so much data at one time. That, that's the point of it. That's why I use it for this aspect of for rap lyrics. And I see it as an oracle because it analyzes the past with the past is those lyrical content that's been created by this artist to be able to predict the future because based on the lyrics it's been trained on and as it generates an output, it's trying to constantly make prediction. It's trying to predict letter by letter, word by word, sentence by sentence. And somehow it's trying to make a coherent experience and that's a form of prediction. And that is why I see machine learning as this creative oracle, which is good at analyzing data. But how do we measure that creativity? How do we even measure creativity of a human? Because when we have this debate about humans and machines, also like, how do we measure that? Can the creativity even be measured or judged in that type of way? Also, what is the best interface for artificial intelligence to express creativity? Like, is it through those interactive examples I've shown you? Is it through a project like Rakimic Tabia, which is in the works? Is, it, is there another form? Like, how would it help filmmakers in that case? There's a really interesting film called Sunspring, and it's a film that's just, um, it, like, all the script was made by, a, a, by an AI. So it's an AI-powered script, and actors are acting in the film based on that script. I think you lot should watch it. It's a really good film. And it's really funny because of some of the things that the AI says and the amount of emotions that these actors put into that experience was really good. And also where this AI assist in the creative process? That's a big area that I've been interested in even more is, you know, you know, we can make interactive experiences as well, but where does it assist with the creative process? And I think I leave on this point that AI is good at being able to understand patterns and being able to crunch data. And that's, a really good point and if we can understand that in all of our creative process where could machine learning exist then we can essentially embody this a bit more in our work patterns but these are things that i'm still trying to figure out these are things that a number of people in the space are still trying to figure out it's still a very new and emerging space so i think it's exciting times and if this is really helpful and sh and has really touched your hearts to maybe further explore this further i would definitely love to see the cool stuff that you essentially create but i am done please ask away if you have any questions i think i finished just one minute above time but i am done um thank you everyone. thank you so much alex i started one minute over time so that was incredible uh, <laughs> on point timekeeping um i um we've got a couple of questions coming in but do keep them coming because there's some interesting stuff in there i wanted to start by asking you um you just mentioned at the end that this is a really new area this is a new space and you talked a little bit at the beginning about the kind of current capability of machine learning and ai what do you think is the future um. That's a good question. Um, what is the future? I don't know. I feel like so. It's, I feel like um, it's a good question. I say the future is now, and essentially, but I think I think there will be more opportunities. I think that there is an incentive by the big tech companies to somehow have more creatives working machine learning experiences. Um, I think that's been this. It's been this area of study for a long time. Like. Some people see it as the final step for a machine is when a machine is able to embody creativity. Most of the time, a lot of the work around computational creativity or artificial creativity, which is another word for it, has mostly been done in academia. So it's very much been kept away by people who've done like how you make AI to make music, how you make it to do things. And then it's kind of locked off in this way and people, sent, you know, and I think I, I, for me, I, I think it's more about more tools which can allow creatives of all different skills, different abilities to take apart this to take apart this tool and be able to break it, able to expose the flaws, able to explore the positives of the technology 
and also see how that comes to life. So that's kind of like my bias. I think the future will be more tools which maybe don't necessarily need to have a sort of coding or, or, or form of barriers which allow um, creatives to do really interesting pieces of work. So that's kind of how I, I see the future. Amazing. You mentioned a word there, bias, which I wanted to touch on quickly. Um, I've read quite a lot about uh, taught biases within AI and machine learning. I wonder if you could quickly sort of explain that to our audience and, and touch on your, your perspective of how to avoid that happening. I, you can never really avoid bias, right? Um, what you have to do is you have to limit the impact of the bias because you know, human beings were unbiased, you know, the data that's generated in the world is unbiased. I always say the internet is a repository of evil. So if you are sourcing your data from the internet, just off the internet alone, then you'd be prepared to expect, quote unquote, evil in that case. And some of the things you have to do there about, you know, the bias in your data set is you have to spend time in a case kind of like identifying how could we limit the bias of our data set or identifying like what are the particular problems if you're training something i don't know like i don't know cultural topics you know if you're, if you're doing something about cultural topics culturally the world sees things differently so if we trained if our data set was trained on i don't know how you know people in, in england or even people in london see stuff about their world that's very different to everybody outside London. So it's like, if you were to create this experience that's meant to be for everybody in the UK trained on things based on London, then that already causes a lot of implications for a lot of people. So it's just those particular things in mind that, um, that people essentially um, kind of have to bear in mind. But how do you limit the bias of your data rather than removing it? You can't really necessarily remove it. It's kind of like, yeah, limiting that impact. I think, like you say, it's just being really conscious of that when you're kind of putting those data sets together. Um, we've got quite a lot of questions coming in about uh, advice on sort of how to get started in a career in creative technology. Um, for someone who hasn't worked in that space before, but is really interested, what would be your words of wisdom for breaking into it? So it's an interesting term because the term creative technology actually came from the world of advertising from what I've recognised. And it was kind of when advertising agencies were, I don't know, beginning to increasingly engage in digital and they wanted somebody to sit on that in that table between this really weird narrative that if you're technical you're not creative but if you're creative you're not technical which i think is very flawed um and first it's like the, you know there's essentially the two things that you need to have as a creative technology is to embrace your creativity more and more because there's always that thing where our designers have this issue with developers and you know developers see themselves I'm not creative which is a very flawed narrative and I think it's embracing your creativity and then finding the best way to express your creativity so when I see myself as a creative technologist I essentially know that the two tools I always have in my arsenal is some form of design and some form of code and I express myself through those two tools and I say the first place to start is to learn how to get into that habit of embracing your creativity and then learning code, or learning design, being better at those two, two things, and then trying to express yourself creatively through that. There are a number of jobs that have positions for creative technologists where essentially you're kind of the person who, has the hack, you're the hacker in a way. You kind of, well, I mean, hacker not in the sense of hacking into systems, but you're bringing things together. You're hacking ideas, you're hacking prototypes, you're kind of visualizing it fast. So you've got to learn how to be scrappy, you've got to learn how to deal with the imperfect, but also it creates really cool, interesting stuff. There's a question actually from Dominica that leads on to that, which is specifically about your team at Kamuzi. Um, and she asks, do you hire any designers without coding uh, or kind of AI machine learning background? For example, do you have graphic designers to work purely on the interface branding of your project? Or does your team always need to have that kind of duality of skills that you just touched on? It's a good question. Um, because community, in my opinion, is, is a design studio that doesn't really have focus. If you look at our website, you check our projects, no project is the same. Like we could work on machine learning experiences, like creating chatbots or stuff. And then one minute we're working with Summit Council on how we could improve the council estates in Summit. Like our projects have never kind of been like what, they're never the same. Um, they've always embodied like they've embodied themes like maybe addressing critical like trying to engage in critical conversations about the world around us 
trying to engage societal themes. And so for me, I don't necessarily have like a discipline of like what a designer should be. Um, I think for me, I'm, a lot of the things I do, I've been very self-taught. And so I always have that maybe opinion of trying to have people who are willing to be anti-disciplinary, which I heard that term first on MIT Media Lab, where they call themselves an anti-disciplinary space. So I would want a designer, not a graphic designer, but I would want a designer who is able to engage with the world of graphic design, UX design, UI design, product design, but having that multifacetedness to themselves and being willing to be open to adaptation. Because I think that's, you know, new, the design studios of the future will be smaller, nimble, and have to adapt. And I think for us, that's kind of how we work in community is in that approach. That touches really nicely on yesterday's theme of the festival was all about kind of generalism over specialism and, and which of those sort of comes up trump. So it's really interesting to hear your take on that as well. Um, a couple more questions. You mentioned there that a lot of the stuff that you've learned has been very self-taught, but we've had a few questions about where people should turn to learn more about this. Are there any specific courses uh, that specialise in machine learning and design? Uh, that look at you know the, the creative side of this as opposed to just the, the sort of science side so um yeah there is you know um people you know like i said i'm going to be biased i might plug university of arts and Creative computing institute here i'm going to plug them you know just that's one that's one place so there's university route if you want to be willing to sit there in university for a while there's also non-university routes one of the perfect things i like to talk about is um Especially, I introduced machine um, ML5.js, which is a machine learning um, library for friendly web machine learning experiences. And um, somebody who's really taught that extensively is somebody called um, Daniel Schiffman, and his YouTube channel is called The Coding Train. And he is the best. Like he's the best. Like um, he when I when I was asked to be a university lecturer and teach, I was so scared, and so I watched his videos. And I was like, oh, I don't need to be perfect. But it, he, just, he just has um, a bubbly energy about him and he breaks down everything really well in terms of how to engage in the creative application of machine learning. There's also like a number of courses. If you just Google creative application for machine learning course, you will see that there are courses that come up when looking at that artistic application, which kind of removes you away from the sciences because I'm not gonna lie, even teaching machine learning for myself, having to understand the theories it went in one ear and it went in and went out the other ear so it's like um so those courses are more practical and you do get introduction to the theory but the theory that you need to know in order to engage in creativity so yeah I think it's really refreshing to hear you say that, you know, like you aren't hyped and get, you don't get excited by the kind of science and intense theory side of it. Because I think there is a, a, a kind of an illusion that you have to know every single bit of that stuff to be able to make a career in that space. And you've shown that's very much not true. Um, probably got time for two more questions. Uh, I'm going to ask a question from David, who's uh, said that as a student with a limited budget and a small amount of experience, how difficult is it to incorporate machine learning into our projects? I think this is where, why I'm an advocate for ML5.js because um, if you are able to you know, learn JavaScript, um, ML5.js works really fine with P5.js. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with P5.js, but P5.js is a library which is dedicated for creative coding and created by Lauren McCartney. Um, and it's a, um, it's a simple, it's kind of was used as a way to help creatives, artists to learn how to, to learn JavaScript, but doing it from the form of creativity. And so ML5.js, the machine learning library kind of fits in well with that. Um, also it's Teachable Machine. So Teachable Machine is trying to reduce those barriers because it, I'm aware that with a limited budget, it just makes things really, really um, super hard. Um, so I think it's like leveraging the particular tools because there has been a movement by people to reduce these barriers. Hence why you're able to see a lot of creative stuff happen. And a lot of the examples I showed very much were built using those tools to basically reduce those barriers. Because yes, if you really want to have an extensive experience, it does cost you money. Like it, it does cost you money. And that can hold you back as well. I'm going to end on this. This is a big question from Johnny Brave. 
who has a great name. Um, he asks, what do you think will happen when machines will learn how to create? Will there be just a couple of agencies with, uh, who kind of hold those AI tools who will keep the whole market for themselves and what will happen to creative people? I don't really think that machines will learn how to create. I think they might just help us reduce, they might just, you know, they might just help us reduce like just certain things in our creative process which we don't have to spend five hours doing. So it might mean if you're editing a film now and you're able to train a model on like how are the best scenes in films and you train this model to analyze every scene of the film and you know you tell the model all right cool i want you to pick out the scenes that you think are the best scenes so that i can put this together for the film that's just an example of how you can get ai to work what happens then is you know it helps you to sort of in that case maybe reduce time reduce like frustrations maybe you might like the editing process and you say you know what i want to go through everything and spend 10 hours but not all of us like editing a lot of us like creating rather than doing that part so i think for me my my argument and my viewpoint is more about allowing creative people to spend more time in the creative process rather than it's this aspect of you know and i hope that doesn't happen but you know how it is in a capitalistic structure that we're in you know we you know we'll you know, profit over people can do this thing at times. But I hope it doesn't happen to be that case. And my, my goal has always been about more showing how the tools can help reduce maybe the burden that also comes with the creative process rather than trying to replace creative. So I, I'm not really part of that sort of, um, that, that, that crew, um, yeah. So Johnny, you don't need to worry, I think is the, uh, is the conclusion there. <laughs> uh, and computers are stupid, by the way. So <laughs> let's, that's, that's always my thing. And what a beautiful note to end on. Uh, Alex, thank you so much for your time this morning. Thank you for all those questions that we've had coming in. Um, we've had quite a lot of questions we didn't have time to answer, but we're collecting all of these and we might ping some to you um, post-festival, Alex, to get your yeah. thoughts on some of those as well. Um, but thank you. It's been, a, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so Thanks. much for your time. But there is still more of the festival to come. Alex has kicked off day one beautifully, uh, but the rest of the day is carrying on of this theme of mind over machine. Uh, so next up, we are hearing from Analog Folk uh, at 1.30 p.m. who are going to be talking to you about uh, how to create digital campaigns that really talk to, to humans, to our human emotions. So sign up for that. Um, make sure you're sharing any of the kind of screen grabs, the content that you're capturing from these sessions, your notes, your takeaways, on our Instagram and Twitter. Uh, Instagram, we are uh, newblood underscore Dan Dad, and Twitter, we are at Dan Dad Newblood or something like that. Just search them, you'll find them. Um, do go look at the dots and look at all the amazing work that is on view there. There's some brilliant digital projects on there as well that you can go and have a look at. And that is all we've got time for in this session. Thank you for being part of it. Take care. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Alex. I started one minute over time, so that was incredible uh, <laughs> on point timekeeping. Um, I um, we've got a couple of questions coming in, but do keep them coming because there's some interesting stuff in there. I wanted to start by asking you. Um, you just mentioned at the end there that this is a really new area this is a new space and you talked a little bit at the beginning about the kind of current capability of machine learning and ai what do you think is the future uh, it's a good question um uh, what is the future i don't know i feel like so it's, i feel like um it's a good question i say the future is now and essentially but i think i think there will be more opportunities i think that there is an incentive by the big tech companies to somehow have more creators working machine learning experiences. Um, I think that's been this, it's been this area of study for a long time. Like some people see it as the final step for a machine is when a machine is able to embody creativity. Most of the time, a lot of the work around computational creativity or artificial creativity, which is another word for it, has mostly been done in academia. So it's very much been kept away by people who've done like how you make AI to make music, how you make it do things. And then it's kind of locked off in this way and people, you know, and I think, I, I, for me, I think it's more about more tools which can allow creatives of all different skills, different abilities to take apart this, to take apart this tool and be able to break it 
able to expose the flaws, able to explore the positives of the technology and also see how that comes to life. So that's kind of like my bias. I think the future will be more tools which maybe don't necessarily need to have a sort of coding or, or form of barriers which allow um, creators to do really interesting pieces of work. So that's kind of how I, I see the future. Amazing. You mentioned a word there, bias, which I wanted to touch on quickly. Um, I've read quite a lot about uh, taught biases within AI and machine learning. I wonder if you could quickly sort of explain that to our audience and, and touch on your, your perspective of how to avoid that happening. I, you can never really avoid bias, right? Um, what you have to do is you have to limit the impact of the bias because you know, human beings were unbiased, you know, the data that's generated in the world is unbiased. I always say the internet is a repository of evil. So if you are sourcing your data from the internet, just off the internet alone, then you'd be prepared to expect, quote unquote, evil in that case. And some of the things you have to do there about, you know, the bias in your data set is you have to spend time in that case, kind of like identifying how could we limit the bias of our data set or identifying like what are the particular problems if you're training something i don't know like i don't know cultural topics you know if you're, if you're doing something about cultural topics culturally the world sees things differently so if we trained if our data set was trained on i don't know how you know people in, in england or even people in london see stuff about their world that's very different to everybody outside London. So it's like, if you were to create this experience that's meant to be for everybody in the UK trained on things based on London, then that already causes a lot of implications for a lot of people. So it's just those particular things in mind that, um, that people essentially um, kind of have to bear in mind. But how do you limit the bias of your data rather than removing it? You can't really necessarily remove it. It's kind of like, yeah, limiting that impact. I think, like you say, it's just being really conscious of that when you're kind of putting those data sets together. Um, we've got quite a lot of questions coming in about uh, advice on sort of how to get started in a career in creative technology. Um, for someone who hasn't worked in that space before, but is really interested, what would be your words of wisdom for breaking into it? So it's an interesting term because the term creative technology actually came from the world of advertising, from what I recognise. And it was kind of when advertising agencies were, I don't know, beginning to increasingly engage in digital and they wanted somebody to sit on that, in that table between this really weird narrative that if you're technical, you're not creative, but if you're creative, you're not technical, which I think is very flawed. Um, and first it's like, the, you know, there's essentially the two things that you need to have as a creative technology is to embrace your creativity more and more. Because there's always that thing around our designers have this issue with developers and you know developers see the I'm not creative which is a very flawed narrative and I think it's embracing your creativity and then finding the best way to express your creativity so when I see myself as a creative technologist I essentially know that the two tools I always have in my arsenal is some form of design and some form of code and I express myself through those two tools and I say the first place to start is to learn how to get into that habit of embracing your creativity and then learning code, learning design, being better at those two, two things, and then trying to express yourself creatively through that. There are a number of jobs that have positions for creative technologists where essentially you're kind of the person who, has to hack, you're the hacker in a way. You kind of, well, I mean, hacker not in the sense of hacking into systems, but you're bringing things together. You're hacking ideas, you're hacking prototypes, you're kind of visualizing it fast. So you've got to learn how to be scrappy, you've got to learn how to deal with the imperfect. But also it creates really cool, interesting stuff. There's a question actually from Dominica that leads onto that, which is specifically about your team at Kamuzi. Um, and she asks, do you hire any designers without coding uh, or kind of AI machine learning background? For example, do you have graphic designers to work purely on the interface branding of your project? Or does your team always need to have that kind of duality of skills that you just touched on? It's a good question. Um, because community, in my opinion, is, is a design studio that doesn't really have focus. If you look at our website, you check our projects, no project is the same. Like we could work on machine learning experiences, like creating chatbots and stuff. And then one minute we're working with Summit Council on how we could improve the council estates in Summit. Like our projects have never kind of been like what, they're never the same. Um, they've always embodied 
like they've embodied themes like maybe addressing critic like trying to engage in critical conversations about the world around us trying to engage societal themes and so for me i don't necessarily have like a discipline of like what a designer should be um i'm think for me i'm a lot of the things i do i've been very self-taught and so i always have that maybe opinion of trying to have people who are willing to be anti-disciplinary, which I heard that term first on MIT Media Lab, where they call themselves an anti-disciplinary space. So I would want a designer, not a graphic designer, but I would want a designer who is able to engage with the world of graphic design, UX design, UI design, product design, but having that multifacetedness to themselves and being willing to be open to adaptation. Because I think that's, you know, new, the design studios of the future will be smaller, nimble, and have to adapt. And I think for us, that's kind of how we work in community is in that approach. That touches really nicely on yesterday's theme of the festival was all about kind of generalism over specialism and, and which of those sort of comes up trump. So it's really interesting to hear your take on that as well. Um, a couple more questions. You mentioned there that a lot of the stuff that you've learned has been very self-taught, but we've had a few questions about where people should turn to learn more about this. Are there any specific courses uh, that specialise in machine learning and design? Uh, that look at you know the, the creative side of this as opposed to just the, the sort of science side so um yeah there is you know um people you know like i said i'm going to be biased i might plug university of arts and creative computer institute here i'm going to plug them you know just that's one that's one place it is a university route if you want to be willing to sit there in the university for a while there's also non-university routes one of the perfect things i like to talk about is um Especially, I introduced machine um, ML5.js, which is a machine learning um, library for friendly web machine learning experiences. And somebody who's really taught that extensively is somebody called um, Daniel Schiffman. And his YouTube channel is called The Coding Train. And he is the best. Like, he's the best. Like, um, he, when, I, when I was asked to be a university lecturer and teach, I was so scared. And so I watched these videos. And I was like, oh, I don't need to be perfect. But it, he, just, he just has um, a bubbly energy about him and he breaks down everything really well in terms of how to engage in the creative applications of machine learning. There's also like a number of courses. If you just Google creative applications of machine learning course, you will see that there are courses that come up when looking at that artistic application, which kind of removes you away from the sciences because I'm not going to lie. Even teaching machine learning for myself, having to understand the theories it went in one ear and it went in and went out the other ear so it's like um so it's, those courses are more practical and you do get instruction to the theory but the theory that you need to know in order to engage in creativity so yeah I think it's really refreshing to hear you say that you know like you aren't hyped and get, you know, get excited by the kind of science and intense theory side of it because I think there is a, a, a kind of an illusion that you have to know every single bit of that stuff to be able to make a career in that space and you've shown that's very much not true. Um, probably got time for two more questions. Uh, I'm going to ask a question from David who's uh, said that as a student with a limited budget and a small amount of experience how difficult is it to incorporate machine learning into our projects? I think this is where why I'm an advocate for ML5.js because um, if you are able to you know, learn JavaScript, um, ML5.js works really fine with P5.js. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with P5.js, but P5.js is a library which is dedicated for creative coding and created by Lauren McCartney. Um, and it's, um, it's, a sim it's kind of was used as a way to help creatives, artists, to learn how to, to learn JavaScript, but doing it from the form of creativity. And so ML5.js, the machine learning library kind of fits in well with that. Um, also it's Teachable Machine. So Teachable Machine is trying to reduce those barriers because it, I'm aware that with a limited budget, it just makes things really, really um, super hard. Um, so I think it's like leveraging the particular tools because there has been a movement by people to reduce these barriers. Hence why you're able to see a lot of creative stuff happen. And a lot of the examples I showed very much were built using those tools to basically reduce those barriers. Because yes, if you really want to have an extensive experience, it does cost you money. Like it, it does cost you money. 
and that can hold you back as well. I'm going to end on this. This is a big question from Johnny Brave, who has a great name. Um, he asks, what do you think will happen when machines will learn how to create? Will there be just a couple of agencies with, uh, who kind of hold those AI tools who will keep the whole market for themselves? And what will happen to creative people? I don't really think that machines will learn how to create. I think they might just help us reduce. They might just, you know, they might just help us reduce, like, just certain things in our creative process which we don't have to spend five hours doing so it might mean if you're editing a film now and you're able to train a model on like how are the best scenes in films and you train this model to analyze every scene of the film and you know you tell the model all right cool i want you to pick out the scenes that you think are the best scenes so that i can put this together for the film that's just an example of how you can get ai to work what happens then is you know it helps you to sort of in that case maybe reduce time reduce like frustrations maybe you might like the editing process and you say you know what i want to go through everything and spend 10 hours but not all of us like editing a lot of us like creating rather than doing that part so i think for me my my argument and my viewpoint is more about allowing creative people to spend more time in the creative process rather than it's this aspect of you know, and I hope that doesn't happen, but you know how it is in the capitalistic structure that we're in, you know, we, you know, will, you know, profit over people can do this thing at times, but I hope it doesn't happen to be that case. And my, my goal has always been about more showing how the tools can help reduce maybe the burden that also comes with the creative process rather than trying to replace creative. So I, I'm not really part of that sort of, um, that, that, that crew. Um, yeah. So, Johnny, you don't need to worry, I think, is the, uh, is the conclusion there. <laughs> uh, and computers are stupid, by the way. So <laughs> that's, that's always my thing. And what a beautiful note to end on. Uh, Alex, thank you so much for your time this morning.